very good on camera. Thank you. So welcome. Uh, I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Crossroads. And I also want to offer sincere thanks to Father Dan O'Reilly uh, of the Columbia Campus Ministry and also to Dr. Bob Pollock uh, and the research cluster on science and subjectivity. Both of them helped tremendously in organizing this event. I'll make a few comments now to introduce our topic tonight. And I'll ask uh, Father Dan and Dr. Pollock to step up for a moment to, to say a few words. And then I'll introduce our speakers. So that'll be my role here right now. We all know that modern medicine has brought enormous benefits by putting science and technology at the service of, of humanity, of health, human health. But what sometimes is forgotten is that ultimately medicine cannot be reduced to a scientific discipline uh, for the simple reason that people, that patients are not things, but they are persons. And persons being creatures who are in relationships and who are seeking meaning in life. And really, in a way, those two things really come together because that meaning we seek is a relationship with the totality of everything. So truly caring for a patient requires caring for a person. And often contemporary medicine chooses to ignore this critical question. The purely technological or technical approach to medicine is particularly insufficient when it one knows that the patient will not recover. This is the case for some infants who are affected by life-limiting conditions or terminal illness. Here, it's an easy temptation to think that medicine has reached the boundary of its technical powers and that nation should just be allowed to run its course and there's nothing else that can be done. Therefore, it is striking to meet medical professionals who recognize that medicine really is a human endeavor and who are really ready and willing to look at babies and their parents as persons in the belief that no matter how brief each baby's life is, it is a precious, it's precious and it needs to be welcomed and cherished. Tonight we have the privilege to learn about one such group of medical professionals from the neonatal comfort care program at the New York Presbyterian Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital. They will share experiences of beauty and love within the drama of a baby born with a short life expectancy. So before introducing our speakers, I uh, would ask Father Dan and then Dr. Pollock to come up to the podium to say a few words. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for all of your presence here tonight, especially the organization with Crossroads and the assistance from Dr. Pollock. Some of you may know that Crossroads and Columbia Catholic Ministry have had a history of working together to promote events of an intellectual nature in order to service not only the Columbia community, but also New York City at large. The last event that we sponsored was a number of years ago, discussing Ross Douthat's book, Bad Religion, along with Monsignor Lorenzo Albacete, back in 2012. Now, just before that, in the same series, we had the annual Merton Lecture from Dr. Clara Gamer, or her father was a well-known geneticist named Dr. Jerome Lejean, who's the man who discovered the genetic defect, which is now known as Down Syndrome. And the lecture was about how her father dedicated his life to the study of genetics and medicine in order to serve those who sometimes are given a blind eye by society. And tonight, we continue to understand servicing the entire person, <coughs> mother, father, child, and servicing human life. It also happens that today, October the 22nd, is the Catholic feast day of St. John Paul II, who was dedicating his entire life to the service of human life and he wrote a famous encyclical called The Gospel of Life, Evangelium Vitae, in which he wrote this about the value of human life. The Gospel of Life, which we have received from the Lord, is a profound persuasive echo in the heart of every person, believer and non-believer alike, because it marvelously fulfills all the heart's expectations, which, while infinitely surpassing them. Even in the midst of difficulties and uncertainties, 
Every person sincerely open to truth and goodness can, by the light of reason and the hidden action of grace, come to recognize in the natural law written in the heart the sacred value of human life from its very beginning until its end, and can affirm the right of every human being to have his primary good respected to the highest degree. Upon the recognition of this right, every human community and the political community itself are founded. So as we, as a church, recognize the life and service of St. John Paul II, we also are grateful to all those who participate in building up the culture of life right here in New York.
The family founded the Maggie Rose Perinatal Bereavement Program in Maggie's memory. This is a program of the Bereavement Center of Westchester. And Maggie's program provides support to families who face an adverse prenatal diagnosis, infant death, stillborn, stillbirth, or pregnancy loss at any stage. So, without further ado, please, Dr. Parmachini. Is that uh, I discovered that before death there is life. 
What does it mean? When a baby with a life limiting condition is born, we don't know actually the length of their life. Could be minutes, hours, could be days, occasionally weeks or months. And so um, it's really true that before the last day there is a life and we want to sort of support, um, intervene medically or not medically to make uh, this life uh, the most beautiful possible. Um, when we speak with parents uh, during pregnancy, um, try to you know, make a plan for, for when the baby is born, we always say that we're going to follow your baby. We know that life is going to be short, but we don't know how long, but we're going to follow your baby. And so, um, surprises can happen. This is another story. The little boy in uh, mom's arms is a baby who was diagnosed with a sickness, um, very, very uh, terrible. If you take a textbook of medicine and you read about this disease, you're going to read that this is a condition, they say, incompatible with life. There is no uh, life after birth. And so we wait for this baby to be born with this, you know, with this pain in our heart, uh, but ready to welcome him when he was born. Well, he came out, was breathing. Uh, after a few hours, we offered some food. With the help of our feeding specialist, we actually fed him properly. Well, the baby went home with the hospice service and uh, believe it or not, that this is the picture that the family just sent to me very recently. The baby is two years old and in the pictures is with the big brother and the baby sister. Just to say that uh, um, we, we don't know, we have to follow the patient. And we have also cases where the surprise is even better. So this other big boy who looks like the most healthy baby in the world was a, a, a baby whom we met uh, uh, two months before uh, during the pregnancy. And this baby was supposed to have a very, very severe renal condition. He had no amniotic fluid, so his lungs were not supposed to develop. Um, you know, when I'm in labor and uh, I meet the parents, uh, I there, I always say, you know what, uh, we are ready for everything, but you never know. I really learned to say that. And so, when this little boy was born, he was crying very well, like a healthy baby. And so, we basically switched from the comfort care to the intensive care, because after a few days, uh, we realized, yes, the baby is breathing well, he's living, but his kidneys are not working. And so, we started dialysis and shortly, in probably a couple of months, he will undergo transplant, renal transplant, but you know, he made it and it looks like a healthy boy. Uh, but again, follow the baby, follow the patient. And I'm saying this because this is our goal, even with babies that live for a few minutes. Um, I want to go back uh, about uh, um, my um, encounter with the parents at the moment of uh, during the pregnancy. Um, I, I share with them my proposal. I introduce myself like I'm a neonatologist. Uh, my goal is to save baby's life. I will do anything for your baby to be healthy and happy. Um, however, we are going to support you and your baby even if medicine has some limits. And uh, I realized right away that parents have this desperate need to be parents, to be moms, to be fathers. Uh, but it's very scary, they're very afraid. Uh, and rightly so, because I don't think you can even, I mean, it's even difficult to think about that you have a baby and this baby is going to die in your arms. Therefore, um, my, uh, our first proposal is really uh, underlying how precious this baby is for us and underlining again that before that there is life. And so concentrating uh, our care, medical and non-medical, um, how can we welcome this baby once the baby is born? And um, so I ask, uh, you know, the baby boys, the baby girls, we have names, and by doing so I want to communicate to them how much of our care for that baby. And I noticed after a while that uh, um, there is a sort of affective competition 
because a parent cannot stand the fact that somebody else loves their baby more than them. <laughs> and so, um, you know, sharing my interest for that baby, which is genuine, um, I help them become more free to love that baby. Okay. So, we call comfort care the satisfaction of basic needs. This is easy to say, like, when a baby is comfortable, when it's welcome, when can go to the family, when it's fed, when it's warm, when he or she doesn't suffer pain. Now this looks like so, so easy, but in reality our babies are, let's say, complicated, they have many, many problems, and also our hospitals are not organized in a way to welcome a situation like this, their intensive care. So uh, it's sometimes extremely difficult because we have to go against the policies, against the rule and regulation of the hospital. We have to create special spaces for them. But uh, um, you know, our our program is the, is the proof that we can do it. I want to share with you some pictures. I have the permission from the families, obviously, and uh, I want you to notice that the prevalent sentiment is joy. Joy because whatever means one was the baby was alive, they were happy to have a baby with them. Look at the expression of the, this father or this little sister. They are just happy for the baby who now is with them. Another need that little babies have is to be warm. So we do a lot of kangaroo care. I don't know if you can notice the little girl hidden um, under their mother's shirt. We do kind of care with mom and dad. As a matter of fact, this little girl uh, lived for 12 hours and she was kangaroo by mom and dad all the time. She was never alone in the bed. Um, you know, this, this case was many, many years ago and uh, I, I do remember that, uh, you know, the baby died after 12 hours and the day after the mom was discharged only before she, she was discharged, I went to talk to her and I told the parents that, you know, I was sorry um, for the little baby and they told me, don't say you're sorry because we really experience to be parents. And so those 12 hours were for us like a party. I mean, we know our life was going to be short, but, you know, you made possible for us to be parents. Another big need for babies is to be fed. When a baby cries, you give food and they're happy. Mm -hmm. So um, we uh, encourage our mothers to breastfeed, bottle feed. Many of our babies, they're very weak and uh, they have uh, abnormality of the oral cavity. So sometimes it's challenging. We have a uh, feeding specialist working with us, very dedicated to this program. They put together special devices because each baby should enjoy the flavor of the milk and, um, and uh, in their short life, not be dehydrated on anything. They need to have a great life. And so we really focus on that. Babies need to be pain free. Now, again, in my long, long experience, uh, who really suffers in those situations are the parents because they are aware they have a little baby in front of them and it's going to be really short time. Babies with these diseases are very weak and uh, the way they die is actually very peaceful. They basically fell asleep and, uh, and so very, very, very rarely we need to give them uh, any painkillers, but we have plenty of painkillers. Um, uh, also, it's been scientifically proved that the number one painkillers for babies is actually being held and being fed. And so we definitely use uh, the means of before and also to have babies comfortable, as you can see in those pictures. Now, you know, over the course of these many years, uh, we really focus on making these babies comfortable and also make sure that the family were happy with the service we provide and so we were asking the question are this baby this baby is really comfortable you know because we always talk about comfort care but it's really true and and we do have um, pain scores but you know being comfortable is not just being pain free it's much more than that 
and so at a certain point we decide that well, the parents will be the best person to judge whether their baby is comfortable or not. And so we decide to ask them. We uh, offer them to fill out questionnaires, anonymous questionnaires. And uh, the study is not yet finished, uh, but I disclose with you some numbers. Uh, we had uh, up to now 30 questionnaires filled fill out by mom and dads. And uh, the vast majority of the parents were very, very happy. They judged the environment to be very welcoming and peaceful. They had the opportunity to hold the baby, to feed them. And to the question, do you think that overall your baby received comfort, um, almost all moms and all dads say yes, always. Which is uh, um, very, for us, is very, makes us happy because, uh, you know, we, we are doing good service. Also, we decide to ask them to give us an image or a metaphor. Um, basically, how do they um, um, judge to be the comfort care? What's comfort care for you? And then just reporting here a um, few comments that uh, some parents made. So this one said, uh, the comfort care is pure love, unadulterated longing for goodness. This other one an umbrella that tries to protect the baby. Another one, a band that helps healing. And another one again, a beautiful common corridor between this world and the next. So uh, the results of this study, along with our experience of all these years, make us understand that we really have the same heart. The heart of the uh, professional is similar to the heart of the parents because through this treatment I think we addressed three big fundamental needs. One, the need, the need of the baby to be loved and to be welcomed. Second, the need of the parents to be parent, to love their baby. And third, the need that we have as medical professional to uh, answer to the cry of help that that is within our patients. Also, that we have the same heart uh, is true thinking about how our program came about because uh, uh, I kind of started on my own at a certain point uh, through you know, encountering uh, mothers during pregnancy. But then over the course of a few years, one by one other professionals came to me asking, do you need help? What would you want to do? So beautiful. So um, I understand that when something is really beautiful, it attracts people. And so people want to help and want to build up. And um, this is the comfort care that came about as it is now. So I'm the medical director. Fran here is my clinical care coordinator. And then we have a bunch of other people social workers, feeding specialists, child lab specialists, psychologists chaplains is working with us and uh, all of them um, they really um, give their own um, you know ability from a professional point of view to support this little baby and the family now also you know obviously we realize that all of this that we do is not going to be able to fill up the um, emptiness of the fact that uh, you 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 have lost a child. But all these activities that we do um, allows us to stay with the family, to be present. And this is the most important thing because the, the experience of going through the loss of a child is uh, can be lived for a family alone. And so as a conclusion, because I started saying that there is a problem, promise uh, for happiness, at the birth of anybody. You know? I want to say that through all these years of work, I realized that yes, it is possible to, to experience a foretaste of this happiness. The problem you really need to look, to look each single case, each single family, each baby, and you find a moment in which um, uh, there is beauty and there is truth, as those pictures that I showed you before expressed very well. And a great example of this is this frame that a mother embroidered and she put on 
above the baby screen. And this, um, you read the little phrase, you are loved. Now, I want you to notice, she did not write, I love you. She wrote, you are loved. Why? Because I think she realized that with all her love, she was not able to save that baby life. And she realized that um, somebody else needs to come and save this baby's life. And I think our team worked for what we are trying to do.